Nicole, and I'm happy to introduce my friend Nakaway Cuevas Barrios here. Uh, well, just yeah, welcome Nakaway. Yeah, Nakaway um, and I met in teacher training at IMS in 2017, and she lives in New York City. Um, considers herself Nurican, uh, New York, and Puerto Rico. <laughs> And there's lots of wonderful things you could read about Nakaway and her bio, like her spiritual depth of spiritual practice in this insight meditation tradition and her long history um, training at both Spirit Rock and IMS with Joseph Goldstein as one of her primary mentors. But I was thinking of things to say that you might not read in her bio. And that's one of the things I've grown to love about Nakaway is her um, deep integrity and uh, just understanding relational practice and, um, yeah, what it means to be a human being who loves and cares in the world and in her relationships and her personal relationships. I always feel like she's listening when I'm talking and very interested in, yeah, how things are going. So I'm su super happy that she's here at Common Ground and Hope that this is one of many visits, and I hope you learn to love her as much as I do. <laughs> Testing. How we? Oh, that, that's too loud. Think. Is that good? No. no? Yeah. Testing. A little? Oh, um, how about now? Can you hear me? Yeah, everybody's okay. Okay, good. And on Zoom, everybody's okay. Can they hear? Great. So, thank you, Shelly. And yes, welcome. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I came here many years ago and I was so impressed by this beautiful meditation center. So I'm really happy to be back here. And um, Shelly is a special friend for me. So we've already started talking about Dharma subjects and the theme of tonight. We started to explore it together. It's a beautiful to have spiritual friendships that you can, you know, talk about these things together. It's so important in this, in your spiritual path. So, um, so yeah, I'm happy to be here. Uh, yeah, I'm from New York. Uh, my, my ancestry is from Puerto Rico. And uh, the Dharma, I love the Dharma. It has really helped to transform my life in so many ways. And that's why I love to share it because um, I feel like it is a true teaching of liberation. So it's a wonderful practice and a wonderful path to share with everyone. So, um, Tonight, we're going to explore equanimity, embodied equ equanimity. And uh, before that, we'll just do a sit. So why don't we um, first get into a nice, comfortable posture for meditation. Just arriving into the room, kind of just allowing all the resonance of today whatever happened today, however it was, just kind of letting that drop away and just arriving in this room right now. Feeling the presence of just being here, whether sitting on the cushion or a chair, or if you're lying down at home, whatever posture is suitable for you so that you can be awake and aware, but yet relaxed. And so that's really what we're looking for in our meditation posture. So just kind of being present with whatever is in your heart, your mind. Just noticing what's here. Maybe taking a few deep breaths down in your belly, slowly exhaling. Checking out how the body's doing right now. How are the shoulders? Maybe relaxing a little bit. Shoulders, relaxing the shoulders, relaxing the jaw. 
any tension around the jaw. Just doing a light scan, maybe around the eyes, You're holding any tension around the eyes, just softening the eyes. Softening the belly. I'm just letting go of any holding. Arriving, let the body just be grounded. Let the Mother Earth receive, receive you, hold you, nourish you, feeling the Earth underneath us, just giving us support as we meditate. As we sit in this awareness, Feeling embodiment. How does it feel to be embodied and alive? Feeling the energies of the body. Pressure maybe of the sitting, sitting on a cushion or on the floor, on the chair. The sensation of body. The aliveness of being alive, how does that feel? And just opening up, relaxing into that awareness. Perhaps feeling the breath moving in and out of the body. Gentle rhythm. Nowhere to go, nothing to be. Just allowing ourselves to arrive right here in this moment, just as it is. Whatever thoughts, just allowing them to be not making them right or wrong. Just aware that they're rising and passing away. Feeling the spine rising up from the pelvis and finding the center of your body. See if you could feel the sensation of being centered, not too far forward, not too far back or to the sides. You could even play with being centered. Where's your center? What does that feel like to be centered in between the earth and the sky? Spine rising up, relaxed and centered. Feeling the strength of finding your center and allowing everything else to relax around the center. Allowing sounds to arise and pass away. Holding on to nothing. Making any last minute adjustments. Checking in, relaxing the shoulders, the belly, the jaw, a little bit more. Softening, opening.
Feeling the breath gently moving through the body, this gentle rhythm. And checking, releasing any holding. Softening and opening. Just receiving whatever's here with kindness, with openness. All is welcome, just as it is. Feeling grounded on the earth. The earth holding us, nourishing us. The space around us. body resting on the earth, the mind resting in the body. Letting the awareness infuse the body. Feeling grounded, centered. And resting, resting in awareness. The mind starts to wander, 
and come back to the contact points with the earth, with the sitting, feeling the sensations of sitting. Softening, relaxing a little bit more, checking in with the shoulders, the belly, releasing any stress or tension.
staying with that center of calm and peace as thoughts rise and pass away, body sensations, breath, just aware of that center holding it all, the spaciousness with calm.
In the last few minutes of the sit, again, just coming into embodiment. Maybe opening the awareness to sitting in Sangha together, feeling the energies of all of us together meditating. The sacredness. connection. Be sending some meta to everyone here at home on Zoom, here in this room. Just opening up the heart space, wishing well. Wishing peace and blessings to all. Wishing health and well being. radiating out to each one of us with these well wishes. Nice energy in here. <clears throat> yeah, stretch. If you need to move around, stretch a little bit. Okay with the sound? We're good. Everybody can hear me? Oh, we can't hear me? Oh. Or maybe just put it louder. Put it on the other one? How's that? Is that better? Yeah, you okay? Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're good. Everybody could hear me all right? Good. All right. I'll try to speak clearly. Sometimes I get a little soft, so I will try to bring my voice up. Oh, okay. Testing, one, two, three, four. <laughs> yes. 
Better? Oh, okay. <laughs> Technology. Okay. So, hmm, that felt good. Meditating together. So I was just reflecting today was such a beautiful day. The spring is blooming, all the, the trees and the flowers. Um, I got a couple of whiffs of lilac today. Ooh, delicious, quite delicious. <laughs> and there's some kind of solar happening. We may even get to see some Northern lights tonight. So that's exciting. We're floating in space and the sun is, is giving out some kind of solar energy. So this should be interesting. I'm hoping that we could see. I've always wanted to see the Northern Lights. <laughs> so that'll be special. So yeah, it reminds us that we're part of something so much greater, right? Keeps on expanding. Wow, we're part of nature. We're part of this beautiful uh, springtime blooming. We're part of this universe with this sun that's doing its thing. So it's always nice. I, I find it helpful to always expand my awareness because it could get so contracted, you know, into our daily worries and our daily affairs, that kind of expanding is sometimes really helps. I like looking at the sky sometimes just to do that, to just expand my mind and my consciousness and my awareness. Little things in nature are so helpful. So tonight I was going to talk a little bit about equanimity. I'm sure many of you that have sat in retreats and here in Common Ground, you've heard equanimity mentioned is one of the four Brahma Viharas, the heavenly abodes. So it's the fourth Brahma Vihara. And I love that, that it's a heavenly abode. You know, there's something really just saying that equanimity is this heavenly abode. It's, there's a spaciousness about it. You know, it's, it's a beautiful quality that to be cultivated in Buddhism. It's also the seven factors of enlightenment. It's the last one. So it's a, it holds a very special place in the teachings. And uh, the word itself, um, it may not be too familiar because we don't really use it that much. Because um, we never say, oh, you lost your equanimity. No, I don't <laughs> You know, you say you lost your cool, you lost it. Sometimes if I'm referring to myself, I just lost it. You know, what are you losing? You know, balance of mind, equanimity, right? But the word is not, we don't use it that much in our vocabulary. So when I first came into Buddhism, it, you know, I didn't really understand too much what they meant. And for me, my relationship with equanimity, um, it began when I started to sit Goenka retreats. I don't know if the people are familiar with Goenka style retreats. He's a teacher and he does retreats up in Massachusetts. He has, he has retreat centers all over the world. And his particular style of uh, teaching is scanning. He does a lot of body scanning and he teaches uh, through the body scanning to be aware of the sensations, you know, in the body. And it really helped to ground me very much in being aware of embodiment, you know, because so much of the time we're up in our heads, you know, constantly thinking in the thinking world that very rarely do we sink down and feel what's here in our bodies. So I really, it helped me a lot to, um, get embodied, you know, the, what embodiment meant. And I thought that technique was very helpful for me. And how he would do it was he, just to be aware of whatever sensations. So if you were feeling tingling or burning or numbness or coolness or heat, whatever the sensation was, as you're scanning with your awareness through your body, you're just aware of the, all these different sensations that are happening all the time, right? As we're sitting here, we're having sensations. Some may be pleasant, some may be unpleasant. If you have any pain in your body, it could be unpleasant, but you're just being aware of what's happening in our bodies. And he helped me to really get a sense of embodiment. And then the tone of whatever you're feeling, we call it Vedana, could be pleasant or unpleasant or even neutral. It doesn't you know, necessarily produce anything. And what he used to say when you would feel whatever sensation as you were scanning, he would say, remain equanimous. Right? You would hear this, he was a big Indian, if you've ever seen a picture of him, you know, he's like a, a grandfather, heavy, heavy set, and he would just, you would hear his voice, remain equanimous. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> 
And I learned a lot, though, with that, you know, because what I learned was that it was, first of all, the sits were difficult because it was one hour and you had to just sit, you you know, they, you were encouraged not to move. You had, you had noble silence and you were sitting still for one hour. And I learned that um, with unpleasant sensations, especially, um, the more that I fought and pushed against it, the worse it got, you know. And then when I learned to open up and relax to the unpleasant sensations, it turned into me being able to investigate what was going on, not pushing it away. So I learned a lot about, um, you know, so-called Vedana, you know, these different sensations that we get that could be in the body or in the mind, you know, painful thoughts or unpleasant, pleasant thoughts, or pleasant, you know, so all these are Vedana things. And that we can actually, um, we can actually, practice cultivating equanimity with what, and that's what we're doing, right? When we're sitting in meditation, if we have an unpleasant thought or an unpleasant body sensation, we're being with it, you know, we're, and the more that we can accept what's going on and open to it, the more that it could reveal whatever's there, whatever lesson is there, whatever its texture, we could learn more about it. But when we're pushing and with fear and we don't want it, then it's a whole different relationship to whatever's happening. So equanimity really opens up this balance of mind, this way of opening the mind to whatever's there in a very balanced way with whatever's arising, you know, whether it's in the mind or in the body. So as we continue to practice with this equanimity, it gets, you know, gets stronger. Like everything that we practice in our, in our lives, you know, the more that we practice and become aware of it, the stronger it, it will get. So until the mind becomes unshakable, it just has this balance of mind with whatever's happening in our life, we're able to hold it in a balanced way. And as we know, that's very difficult because life presents so many different challenges, both in, in our personal lives and also in the world. You know, we have to deal with all of it. So that how do we hold, you know, everything that's going on? And the Buddha said this, this beautiful quality of equanimity where we can kind of um, pull back from the reactivity, right? So you're pulling back the Vika, we call it in Pali, it's just to pull back. And instead of being enthralled and identified with the reactivity, we're kind of pulling back and seeing what's, what's here, what's going on, so that we're able to study and see with clarity what's happening. So this is kind of equanimity, gives us that space, like a sacred space, just to step back and say, well, what's going on here? You know, and seeing it from a different, different perspective, maybe from a wider lens than the reactivity, which keeps you very um, small and constricted and very self-identified. The, um, the equanimity is more spacious. It's not personal. It's more opening up and seeing what's going on and holding it with this balanced mind and heart, no matter what's happening in our lives. So we know that this um, is a practice, right? So it, it definitely is a practice. Um, for me, in my personal life, um, I know that my profession, even before I be, uh, got into Buddhism, I worked as a midwife. And I worked as a midwife for many years. And that really helped me a lot. I didn't realize that I was practicing equanimity, but I was, you know, because I had to be steady and calm while a woman was in pain or having a baby, you know, and going through labor. So that really helped me to start to get the flavor of what it was to stay steady, you know, stay with an open heart, stay with connected, because it's not a disconnection. You know, sometimes you could think that Equanimity is like this very detached, cold type of um, state of mind, and it's not. It's very connected. You know, you're totally connected with whatever is happening in the moment, and you're holding it in a very spacious way. So I realized with the midwifery that uh, that I was already training in this, you know, in, in uh, this beautiful state of mind of equanimity, and as even as a healthcare provider. You know, I also had to practice that, to be equanimous with whatever was being presented to me, whatever was happening. I had to just stay balanced and my mind had to be steady because you could imagine if I'm freaking out and she's freaking out and then the whole thing is going to go not good. <laughs> so I learned there, um, you know, the importance of it. 
And then, you know, you know when you're off, when you def don't have the equanimity, you know, you're losing, right? And we lose, you know, we lose it sometimes and it's just normal, you know? We start to find out our triggers, you know, what are our triggers? How do we get off center? And when I was kind of leading with the meditation, I was pointing to that, that in, for me, equanimity has a sense of embodiment. Like when I feel centered and stable within my body, it tells me when I'm off centered out in the world, you know, because the body with the Vedana, what I was referring to before, will tell you right away something is off. You know, our body is constantly giving us messages. That's why I say embodiment of, of equanimity, because our bodies really can tell us, you know, when something is off, we'll just know something is not right. You know, uh, we're hearing some words and we don't like what we're hearing our body is going to right away react, you know, we'll feel it first in the body. So that's why um, the relationship with equanimity and the body for me is really very important, you know, because we can kind of tune in and find out what's happening because the body is real. It's in this time right now, in this moment, it's not in the past. It's not in the future. It's telling you what's happening right now. So if you're being triggered by something that's happening in your life, you know, some words are coming at you and you're not liking the words, right away your body's going to start to constrict. You know, you're going to feel start separation from that person. There's going to be a whole lot of things happening. And if we could be sensitized to what's going on in this body, it will help us a great deal. Before we go into the next step of maybe something coming out of our mouth that we're going to regret, you know, so... Um, so the, what I say embodied equanimity, for me, it really has been like that. You know, I really can get a sense of when I'm off and when, you know, I feel grounded, I feel stable, I feel, you know, balanced. Um, and that's why I was trying to get that sense in your meditation of, of really embodying, getting to know where, when you feel grounded, when you feel centered, it feels like this. Oh, Okay, this feels grounded, centered, I feel good. And then when you're off, you know, off balance emotionally or or in your body, you know, you know when you're off. So the sense of equanimity and embodiment, I feel are very connected. And for me, it's been a great teacher to do, you know, to notice that that relationship. So going back to the Vedana of you know reactivity. Um we are able to, once we feel that reactivity happening, and it could be toward greed, you know, so it could go the other way too. It's not only aversion, it also could be like greed. You know, you're craving something constantly and you can't, you feel like you have to have it. Um, so the greed part too, is it like this thing that you're not satisfied, it's like a hole and you're constantly trying to fill this hole. So it could go either way, you know, with the pleasant and unpleasant pleasant and uh, unpleasant Vedana sensations. So we're just kind of tuning in to, to see, you know, where we can catch it. So one of the teachings that I love, um, one of the Buddha's teachings that I really love is the teaching that he gave to his son Rahula. And uh, it's not word for word, but the basic teaching was he was trying to, to teach his son um, this thing about reactivity. He was saying, you could catch it in the beginning you could catch it in the middle or you could catch it afterwards. So in other words, before you even, the words come out of your mouth or the action starts to happen, there's something that happens like I was pointing to. Something in your body will tell you something is wrong, right? You feel a constriction, you feel a tightness, maybe your breath starts to you know, go off, your, your pulse. You know, you're getting different signs that something's happening, that, Something that you are being triggered by is happening in you, in your in your home, in your environment, in your work. You know, listening to the news on the TV. I mean, there's so many different ways you could get triggered. So he was saying to the teaching in the beginning, you would catch it there. You know, right in the beginning at that sensation. So if we could catch it right there in the beginning, then the words, the actions, don't need to follow. You could catch it in the middle, like the words are already spilling out your mouth and you're like, oh no, this is not good at all. So you feel, and the momentum already is, you know, you're already into that momentum, right? So sometimes it's hard. Like for me, sometimes if it's already in the middle, it's hard, but there's an awareness that it's happening. And then 
it may be that you totally don't catch it at all. And then you go home later and you say, wow, you know, that was really unskillful. I should have handled that a different way. You know, so that's afterwards. So there's three different points. I love that teaching that he gave his son. You know, could catch it in the beginning with the Vedana, the sensations, the body starts to constrict, the heat, you know, your pulse may start, your breath, all of these different signs. You could catch it there, take a breath, pause. Okay, back to center, back to that sacred pause at center. In the middle, it's kind of hard already once you have the momentum going. But sometimes you could catch, sometimes I'll catch it in the middle and I'll say, Nak, well, you got to redirect this conversation or whatever, you know. So in the middle, I'll start to play with words or I'll, I'll try silence or something. I'm being aware right in the middle, I'm catching myself. Or at the end of it, you know, afterwards I go home and I'm like, oh boy, you know, I really need to apologize for the way that I said this or whatever. So this teaching of um, Buddha to Rahula, I really love it because it really kind of teaches us how we can work with reactivity, you know, and how important it is in our lives, you know, with our families, our friends, in work. Um, this is all different skillful means. That's what we're learning is skillful means to be in life and relationship. So this beautiful uh, state of equanimity is something that we could cultivate. You know, we could make a conscious effort to make it as part of the practice. And again, it's not this cold kind of detached way of seeing a being with people with life. It's really engaged. You already understand a deeper sense of knowing what um, the true nature of life is. You know, there's something deeper that you know when you can bring this sense of equanimity. In other words, we can read into um, the depths of people. You know, sometimes words are coming at us, and if we understand the way that um, that we've all been conditioned, you know, in our lives. You know, to be who we are, our personalities, our identities. Um, and for me, understanding the conditionality, how each of us have been conditioned in different ways, that really helps me to, um, to understand human beings more. And that's, again, understanding the deeper level of Dhamma, you know, of human relationships, of who we are, um, knowing that no one's perfect. You know, no one in this world is perfect. None of us. Me, I'm not no one. Everything is impermanent, all right? So everything is constantly changing, moving, flowing, and that those are the constant laws of the Dhamma. And that it's not personal. You know, a lot of these things, it's not, it's not about me identified with anything. It's not personal, you know? So those kind of Dhamma um, wisdom is behind equanimity. So we kind of hold that. Um, for me, it's really important for me to look more deeply into whatever situation is so that I could see it with equanimity, you know, equanimity. Within equanimity, there's patience. I'm sure you could understand there's a lot of patience that we have with our human relationships and with the world, the way that it's going. We need a lot of patience, spaciousness. Equanimity has a lot of space. It's boundless because as the brow of the haras, the beautiful heart qualities, it's not about a personal energy. This is a boundless energy equanimity. So there's no walls, there's no limits. It's endless, it's boundless. There's warmth because we're actually, this is the heart quality equanimity. So it's, it's mixed in with the compassion, with the metta with the um, sympathetic joy, you know, so it's part of that. So it's a heart, it's intimate. You know, it's getting intimate with this energy and knowing that it helps to understand us as human beings in relationship with each other. There's a connection with even you can say love or God or whatever, it's that, that's how vast this energy is. You know, so we could touch into it. And that's what I was kind of pointing about being the center of where we're at, you know, when we sit, we're cultivating this energy. We can cult intentionally cultivate it. There's joy in there, there's compassion, you know, being able to be with suffering, but yet stay steady and stable. 
you know, not drown in the suffering, not drown in our suffering or in suffering others. We're able to stay steady and straight within the, the suffering and that's compassion, you know, so we're turning that boundless beautiful energy to helping. How could we help? How could we help our own suffering? How could we help others in the world? So we're turning that outward too. So this, this beautiful quality of equanimity um, is vast and we continue to cultivate it. One of the, um, this is actually a, uh, you've probably heard of this is the serenity prayer. This to me is kind of like also beautiful equanimity prayer. God, give us the grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed. Courage to change the things which should be changed and the wisdom to distinguish one from the other. So that's so just a beautiful way of expressing equanimity. God, give us the grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed, courage to change the things which should be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish one from the other, the serenity prayer. That's a beautiful expression of equanimity, you know, and also compassion. Because we're, we're turning that beautiful heart energy to see what can be changed within ourselves and also in the world. So that's a beautiful way of expressing equanimity. And there's something about just um, some of the equanimity phrases, and I'll review a, couple, a few of them because they really kind of express this embodiment of equanimity. One goes, uh, whether I understand it or not, things are unfolding according to a natural law. So this is just nature unfolding, you know, our lives unfolding. Um, the universe unfolding. We don't, sometimes we can't understand things the way they are, but can we trust that things are unfolding? Doesn't mean that we don't step in and try to make things better or, or you know, do our part in the world, but yet we understand that things are unfolding to, you know, with causes and conditions. May I open to the conditions of my body and mind with grace equanimity, just allowing what's whatever's happening with our mind, with our body, with our health, with aging, whatever it is, can we open to things as they are with equanimity? May I open to the conditions of my body and mind with grace? This is how things are right now. So that's kind of like accepting. This is the way it is right now. Sometimes we want things to be different from what they are, right? That causes a lot of suffering. So can I just accept this is how it is right now? And then from there, with that wisdom, with that clarity, we can see what needs to be, what needs to be the next step. But just accepting, you know, what's here. No matter how much I wish things to be otherwise, things are as they are. So there again. You know, sometimes we want things to be different. We want people to be different, um, but things are as they are. Can we just accept things as they are? You know, accept people as they are. It's difficult because we want people to be like us or we want people to think like us. And it's not, it's not real. And we could never have any kind of harmony in this world if we have that attitude. So can we just accept people as they are? We try to understand them. So these are the equanimity phrases that are really kind of point to what this, this beautiful energy of equanimity is. May my heart be big enough to hold the joys and sorrows without being overwhelmed. Beautiful. May my heart be big enough to hold the joys and sorrows without being overwhelmed. That's that vast, spacious, boundless heart quality of equanimity.
So one thing that a lot of times when uh, we talk about equanimity, we talk about the worldly winds. And the worldly winds are conditions that are constantly changing in our world. And today it was so windy. I was definitely like in the worldly winds. <laughs> they were blowing hard today. <laughs> Um, so the worldly winds are uh, pleasure and pain, praise and blame, fame and disrepute, gain and loss. So these are the worldly winds. And as long as we're being pushed around by these winds, we'll never be happy. We'll never be stable. We'll never have any kind of equanimity because the winds are constantly blowing. So we, in our lives, we're going to experience all of these winds, pleasure, pain, of course. You know, we'll have moments of pleasure. We're going to have some pain. There's no way you're going to get out of this lifetime without pain. It's impossible. So can we just understand that this is the way things are? These are the winds that are blowing. And that opens up the heart to some equanimity, some to some space. You know, because some for some reason... We think that we're just going to flow through with pleasant sensations and never, you know, never hit unpleasant. That's impossible. So we all know that. So we're, again, it goes up and down. Praise and blame. Sometimes people will praise you. Sometimes people will blame you. You know, this is just the way it is. You know, it's not anything personal. It's just these are the winds that blow through our lives. And they constantly have us going up and down, our moods up and down. You know, sometimes we're happy, sometimes we're sad, depending on these external worldly winds. So we have no stable ground to sit on because we're constantly being blown by these winds. Gain and loss. Sometimes we're gaining, sometimes we're losing, whether it's money, friends, power, whatever it is. You know, so here again, you know, we're being blown by these winds. And we have no control. We do, as we know, the future, we don't know what's going to happen. You know, we're not in control of nature unfolding. So if we're aware of these winds, then we don't let them push us around. You know, we stay stable and steady in the equanimity, in the peace and the kindness. Um, did I get all of them? Praise and blame. Oh, fame and disrepute. Praise and blame. Yeah. So these worldly winds, um, a lot of times they're taught with equanimity because that's life. You know, we're constantly be tossed by these winds and then we let them affect us, you know. So external conditions will always be changing, in other words. But we have no some control over external conditions. We look at COVID the way it came. It was just like, boom, you know. So this is the lack of control. So the thing is, is that we have to understand that what we have here is the steadiness of knowing that we're steady. We have our practice. We have equanimity in our hearts. Um, we have something to go to refuge in. We create our own refuge, not taking refuge on the external conditions that are constantly changing and moving and shifting with other people, you know, not taking refuge in other people. The refuge is right here in our hearts, in our center. We come back over and over. And this is the beauty of meditating, going on retreats, building up this refuge and this center, because that's truly where the refuge is. So this is the, the teachings of the worldly winds. Can we not let them whip us around? Can we stay stable, steady, grounded, you know, knowing that we can do this. The Buddha would not ask us to do it if he didn't think we could do it. And with the years of practice as you go on, you, uh, you can see it in your own lives. You know, your lives get steadier and you get more balanced as we continue to do this, these practices. They can be a big uh, friend and a, uh, an aid in our life. You know, we keep on coming back to this center, to the refuge, the true refuge. Well, let me see. I was going to end with
because of the situation, um, what's happening in our world, there's a lot of stuff going on. Not only do we have it in our lives, but externally in the world, there's so much going on. And um, the monk, many of you familiar with Thich Nhat Hanh, he was a, a Vietnamese monk. And he uh, lived through the Vietnam War. So I was just gonna read a little passage of how he dealt with external conditions and how he transformed the external conditions. So this piece that he wrote is mindfulness must be engaged. When I was in Vietnam, so many of our villages were being bombed. Along with my monastic brothers and sisters, I had to decide what to do. Should we continue to practice in our monasteries or should we leave the meditation halls in order to help the people who were suffering under the bombs? After careful reflection, we decided to do both, to go out and help people and to do so in mindfulness. We called it engaged Buddhism. Mindfulness must be engaged. Once there is seeing, there must be acting. Otherwise, what is the use of seeing? We must be aware of the real problems of the world. Then with mindfulness, we will know what to do and what not to do to be of help. If we maintain awareness of our breathing and continue to practice smiling, even in difficult situations, many people, animals, and plants will benefit from our way of doing things. Are we massaging our mother earth every time your foot touches her? Are you planting seeds of joy and peace? I try to do exactly that with every step, and I know our Mother Earth is most appreciative. Peace is every step. We shall, shall we continue our journey? So I think this was a beautiful way of uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, in the middle of being a total example, you know, of being in this situation and just being able to transform, to use wisdom, again, stepping back you know, stepping back, seeing, wait a second, this is the clarity, this is the way things are, even though I want them to be different, this is the way things are right now. So with clarity, with peace of heart and mind, what is the next step that I can do here? You know, how can I be of service? How can I be of help? But it's only from that place of seeing clearly, seeing both sides clearly, understanding everything in a deeper way that we can understand what kind of next steps we need to do. So I just wanted to um, leave these, leave you with these beautiful words of Thich Nhat Hanh and how he kind of used his practice. Same thing we're doing here, mindfulness practice and using it to be a benefit to ourselves and to the world too. So I'll leave you with those words and why don't we just take a few moments and let the words settle. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> mm. So we have a little bit of time if anybody would like to make any comments or if you have any questions or want to share anything around your practice with equanimity. Um, we have a little bit of time to share in Sangha. If you would use the mic, uh, the Zoomers will be able to only be able to hear you. Hello, I'm Sean. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say I, I really was enjoying the point you made about um, reposing in equanimity isn't detaching. You're finding a deeper space within yourself, but you're remaining intimate with everything that's happening. The connection is kept. Um, which was a difficult place to be in. And I, 
you know, the whole talk was lovely, but that was something that was really uh, spoke to me. Mm-hmm. That it's uh, it's very visceral. It's loud in here when you're doing that, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, it's the the uh, calling in that the quality of equanimity is like is vast. It's limitless that we can touch that and um, be not bound by this limited idea of what I think I am that maybe can't handle feeling this. Exactly. If we tap into something that's so vast that can be there. Mm-hmm. So I um, I really enjoyed hearing that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a practice. The more that we bring that to mind and, and understand that energy, you know, that's a thing. Because sometimes um, these energies run through us and we're not aware of them. You know, so what are those moments where we're steady and stable and, you know, we feel grounded in our lives? It could be standing in a supermarket, you know, and we're getting restless and impatient. Okay, where's the peace and equanimity in this moment? You know, <laughs> And we take a breath and come back into the body and feel centered and feel the earth, you know, or we're in traffic and somebody's cutting us off, you know, and we're starting to get agitated. Well, let me take a breath here, come back to my center, come back to that space or that energy. So it's claiming it, you know, it's ours, you know, it's there. We just need to be bring more awareness to it and and, uh, and practice with it. Know when it's there and know when it's not there, right? Because you will know when it's not there, when it's not there. And life will bring endless possibilities to practice, as we all <laughs> as we all know. <laughs> so yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you so much for your guidance tonight and your offering um, around equanimity. I especially appreciated, you know, your own experience around being a midwife and holding space for that kind of suffering. And um, I often think about when I, in my own practice, equanimity, as it applies to my own suffering, probably first and foremost, mental, physical, what have you. Um, and I don't th- as directly connect it to the space I hold for others. Although I know it's there, I know it's part of it, but for some reason it's almost like a, it's somehow a sec, it's somehow secondary in my mind. So I appreciate you putting it kind of into prominence in that way. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on, I don't know, just even in your own practice, the relationship between the space you hold for yourself and the space you hold for others. Are they, is it just a kind of mutually strengthening relationship, would you say? Or, or yeah, any thoughts you had would be, would be wonderful. Yeah, definitely, because we're interconnected, you know, so whatever energetic fields I'm creating in the room or in the space between me and that other person, um, it it influences, you know, um, their energy and just everything in the space that we're holding together, you know, so being aware, you know, opening our awareness, sometimes we're just so um, focused and concentrated on, you know, what we have in our mind and now, but if we're opening the field, we can see and I think that has a lot to do with um, with inside dialogue, you know, because you're opening up the space of awareness and you're seeing how your words are affecting somebody else. You're seeing how your energy is affecting somebody else. And that is so vital for you to have a, you know, a decent relationship, you know, whether it's with clients or a pregnant woman for me or whatever, it's always been that relationship of feeling the whole field and seeing what I'm adding to it you know, and how it's affecting the other person and likewise. And so it's an interchange between two people, but the awareness is being opened up and widened so that we could hold it all. But yeah, it's essential, definitely for relationship. Thank you. So thank you all. Anybody else? Is it good?
Can you hear me, Zoomers? Can you hear me okay? No. No. <laughs> okay, great. So just thank you for being here. Thank you for thank you. Thank you, everybody. Offering the Dharma. A pleasure. Yeah. And many of you know that uh, the way Common Ground operates is we we everything we do everything on in the spirit of generosity. This whole center operates on this principle and practice. And when we have a guest teacher like Nakaway, the center offers two thirds of the do donations that come in the night that she's teaching back to Nakaway so that she can su it's support her livelihood and allow her to accept invitations like this to keep teaching. On Donna and this beautiful way of giving and receiving. Uh, and then Common Ground keeps a third to support the operations of the center. So if you'd like to contribute tonight, you can um, add some dollars to the, the bowl in the lobby. You can use the square terminal. Um, you can go directly to our website and there's a donate now button on right on the homepage. You can just click that and, and take you make sure you designate the donation to knock away. Um, and It'll help our bookkeeper Nancy Bowler know where to send it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank and thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. The retreat tomorrow. Oh. Oh yes. If you would like to come to the retreat so we could sit together and deepen our practice together. Yeah. It's very powerful to sit together for that space of time. So we welcome you back. And Nakaway will also be teaching the Sunday evening program. So yeah. come tomorrow and come Sunday too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, friends. Take good Thank care. Thank you. Take care.